writers came here. And this is hallowed ground for Methodism. They came from South Carolina. <coughs> most of them. Uh, it, it amazes me that in South Carolina there were folks who said, yeah, I'll go deal with mosquitoes and palmetto bushes and snakes to carry the word of Christ to Florida. Uh, when Al and I were sent to Ocala, uh, I, one of my friends said, you know, Sue, you should really check and see if that church has any history you can read because there's probably quite a lot of history. So I called the church like, before we came. I said, do you have a, a history, anything written down? And the next day, a book this thick came. <laughs> but I, I thought, well, this will be some reading to put me asleep, to sleep at night. But it really wasn't. It was the story of the early circuit riders in the Fort King area all around this region. And how they started these churches, and, and the church in Ocala, and probably this church has similar stories, uh, when they decided they didn't need dirt floors anymore, because the women were upset, their children were getting filthy coming to church, so they decided to put in a wood floor. And stories, <laughs> my favorite story is that the church decided to have a door, because they just have an open door for anybody to come in, they just decided to put a door on the day they had a dog fight during services. Because everything wandered in the store. Raccoons, dogs, cats, you name it. But the dog fight put it in to the open door policy. Um, this area is rich for Methodism. And I hope you value your heritage and your legacy and how many generations of Methodists have worked here to spread the word of Christ. And as I thought, thought about Scripture this morning, this is, I think, my favorite passage of Scripture. Because it describes for us the heart of God. And this is Luke 15. Now all, and the first verse is very important, so listen to this. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. <coughs> when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The heart of God, the God who doesn't want anybody lost, the God who comes and searches like the shepherd for every single person. It is God's desire that every single person come home and be found. And it grieves the heart of God when anyone is lost. Now, you know, I love how Jesus says, what shepherd doesn't leave the 99 to find the one? Well, no shepherd would. That was major shepherd malpractice. Can you imagine going to the owner of the sheep and saying, well, there was one lost, but I left the 99 in the wilderness. No, that's not normal shepherd behavior. It's not normal human behavior, but it's God's behavior. God's desire, God's heart is always searching, always moving, always going out. It's the heart of the gospel, the incarnation of God. God became flesh to come seek us out. So the, the format of this, and I love this, not just because I'm a gator, but the heart of this passage is seek, find, party. Seek, find, party. Because when God and the people of God find someone, they rejoice, but it's not enough to rejoice alone. They call everyone together to party, to have joy, to be so excited that the one who is lost is home. God's heart gathers in and welcomes. And, and the heart of this is that is the whole story of God. God early on called the nation of Israel to be his searchers in the world. He called the people of Israel to go out on his behalf, to be a blessing to the nations. And he calls all of his people, when Christ came, he calls us as Christians to join in the search. That's what we're called to do, to join God in finding the lost. And so God sends out 
search party after search party. Now, I love it that it's called a search party, right? So what we really have here Love, joy. 
the heart of the of the older brother, the heart of Christ is at its essence joyous. So why is church so often a life sapping? Oh man, my sisters and I, we grew up in First Methodist in Lakeland, and, and whenever I think of older brothers, I think of two older sisters who were in that church. And my sisters and I called them fondly the buzzard sisters. <laughs> because their joy in life was to complain. They were the police of all clothing. They were the police of all behavior. They were the evaluators of everybody in the church. They were the ones who decided who was righteous, who was not righteous, who was polite, who was not polite, who was behaving properly, who was not. And they knew all about all. And they sap any life or love or joy about their presence. Uh, if you're a Saturday Night Live fan, if you've ever seen The Church Lady, perfect. Uh, that is another depiction. No, whenever our, our, our spiritual lives become more uh, tight and rumbling and <coughs> negative than joyous and uplifting and loving, we need to do some older brother for lack of a better word, exorcism. <laughs> the next thing that older brother Itis makes us is, uh, you know, the, the heart of Jesus is compassion. I love how he searches for the sheep, how he has great love. In the father in the prodigal story, he has love for the son no matter what he did. Jesus' heart is all compassion. He doesn't care what we did as long as we come home. But older brothers, if you look at what the older brother says, what does he say? How dare you take in this younger brother of mine who's wasted his money with prostitutes? How dare you? He is despicable. You see the term, Jesus' attitude, which is all compassion, to the older brother's attitude that is contempt. In our own human ways of thinking, it's way too easy to look at people we label sinners and have contempt for them. I love Jesus, thou art all compassion. I love that. But we humans tend to want to have our, what was it somebody said years ago, we like our fish to come into the church already clean. <laughs> I can't tell you how devastating this is the church. I can't tell you how many people as a pastor I've seen who say, I will come back to the church when I quit taking drugs. Or I will come back to the church when I quit living with the man I've lived with for 10 years. Or I will come back to the church. You fill in the blank. I love the old hymn, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. Come, you sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, from the fall. This is the best line. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. <laughs> so what do you think it does to the heart of God when we're passing judgment on his sheep and it becomes contempt instead of compassion? I deal with this all the time in every church I've served. Well, you know how they are, Pastor Sue. The heart of the shepherd is to welcome all. To not tally up what you've done wrong. To not constantly throw in your face what a sinful person you are, but to show you a new life. No, when your compassion turns into contempt, you need to go back to the good shepherd. The next thing is when relationship becomes rivalry. The, old, the shepherd is always looking for the relationship. God is always calling us not only to be in relationship with him, but with each other. You read it this morning. To love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. You know, to love God, to have the Holy Spirit of Christ means that we have relationship. We see every other person as related to us. My husband just got back from Africa. 
and he sat with young African children desperately eating the little bit they had, and he just saw, he said, you know, they are my children as much as our own child is our child. To see relationship, all people are connected to me because God is our Father. The older brother is the older brother of us all. So when we shift into the older brother mentality of rivalry, and we see that all time, all the time in the churches and between churches, that's another simple thing. I don't see you as part of my connection. I don't see you as my team. I don't see you as co-workers in the field of the Lord. I see you as rivals. That's older brother mentality. The last one is sacrifice rather than entitlement. The shepherd came to find all of us and was completely self-sacrificial in it, even the death on a cross. He poured himself out for his sheep completely. But we somehow have turned our lives and the church at times into a place of entitlement where it doesn't reflect the Good Shepherd so much as it reflects us and our desires and our entitlement. All through my ministry, I've had people come up to me and say, Pastor Sue, have you, have you seen so-and-so there in the hospital? And you know what I say every time? Why don't you go see them and call me and let me know how they're doing? Because we are on a team together. Laity and clergy, we are all on a team. This isn't concierge service, you know? Sometimes I feel like, gosh, I'll just have somebody pay me $30,000 a year to be their private pastor. I'll baptize other children. I'll do them a nice funeral. I'll visit them every day. That seems to be the hallmark in a lot of churches. The pastor just needs to visit me. But as long as they're lost sheep, as long as we're on a team to go out and find them, we don't have time to visit the divine. But still, that's the constant refrain. What about me? What are you doing for me? What about this? When it becomes entitlement, when it becomes about you, you are reflecting the older brother and not the heart of Christ. You know, sometimes I think of the worst Methodist church I can imagine is one where they're having a fish fry or a covered dish and the pastor walks in all worn out and everybody just looks at him and says, have you visited everybody yet? As long as there's a lost person in this community, as long as there's a person that doesn't know Christ and God, I want your pastor and I want all of you after them. For you have received your reward. This isn't a club where we serve you. Amen. This isn't a closed, tight-knit group where we look back to 1950 and wish it was 1950 again. This isn't about anything but giving Christ to the world. And to leave this place. To leave this place. Now, Alan and I, we were really dumb. Years ago, we said to Bishop, you know, send us to churches on the trauma unit. Send us to churches that are going to fall apart. Send us to churches that are really, really in trouble. And funny, but he had some to send us to. <laughs> and we'd go to these churches, and it was always the same thing. The people had forgotten their mission. The people had hardened into a club, and the pastor was just paid to serve them. Nothing was moving. The joy of the Holy Spirit was gone. <laughs> and so we had our work cut out for us as we reminded them of our good shepherd who is joyful and compassionate and sacrificial and totally bent on the mission of going and finding the lost. It is my prayer for every church, not just Methodist, every church, that they will know the joy of the shepherd, the great joy of welcoming the lost ones home, of having people come and, and you know, at some point, it was interesting, I was in a Bible study with the same group for five years, and, and one night a woman came in and she said, you know, I am, I have a woman in my office 
voice who's devastated. She needs to know Christ, but I know she will never set foot in the church. And that's when we all said, you know what, Carolyn? You have to be the church to her. You have to be the church outside of here, going to places that need Christ, going to where the hurting are. You notice in the story, the shepherd doesn't sit around in a room and wait for, the, wait for all the sheep to wander in at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. He doesn't do that. He goes and he searches, and there's no end to his search. There is no limit to what he's willing to give. That's the kind of followers of Christ we need, where it's all the line. All for him. You know, that's the history of the Methodist movement. John Wesley got really disgusted with the Anglican Church of England in the 1700s. <coughs> Why? Because they were all older brothers. They had very nice cathedrals and very pretty things, and they all dressed well and they were all very successful. And John Wesley came and made them very angry. It is true when he writes, I've decided that I must become more vile. And he went out, he preached in a field to 3,000 coal miners, to the poor, to the lost, because he said the church has lost its mission. The church is now catering to the wealthy, and it is not going to the hurting. And he started a whole movement, and it transformed the church, and it created a new church here in the United States. And we, the darndest thing is we've lost it. And now Methodism, which started as a revival movement, needs to revive and, and re renovate and recall its own church back to its roots. Now, my favorite thing in St. Paul's Cathedral, if you go to London, go to St. Paul's Cathedral. Huge Anglican, just reeks of older brother, man. Just very, very ornate and well done. If you walk outside in the garden, <coughs> There's a big statue of John Wesley. I love that. I think he would love that. Because he reminded the church of the world outside. He reminded the people of God that their mission is to find the lost sheep. And his basic message was, go, so get out and find them. Leave your comfort zones. Take a risk and go and be like the good shepherd was. Go out and have a search party. You don't do it alone. That's why we come to church. We do it as a team. And we do it with great joy. So you have a search party. And when you find them, you rejoice. You lay them on your shoulders. You celebrate. And then you come back here to worship. And you party, party like crazy. And you fill with the Holy Spirit. Because you see, without the Holy Spirit, we are destined to become older brothers. The Holy Spirit is what makes us like Christ. It's why we come to the communion table. It's why we meditate on Scripture. It's why we gather in groups. It's why we come to worship. To have Christ remake us from within with the power of the Holy Spirit. So, O oh church, come and be transformed. Come and be shifted from older brothers to shepherds who will risk all. Come and receive your joy at the table of Jesus Christ. It's no mistake that he invites in his table everyone, everybody here. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't even have to be baptized. All you have to do is earnestly repent of your sin. And all of this, seek to live in peace with one another. So let us join together in a prayer of confession. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we confess that left to our own devices, when we stray from you, we become like the older brother. We grumble and complain. We treat sinners with contempt. We lose our joy. So we come to your table this morning, O oh Lord, conscious of that and asking for you to make us over in your image through the power of your Holy Spirit. And now hear, O oh Lord, our silent word, prayers of confession, as we seek truly to become a church of the joyous shepherds. So hear our prayers, O oh Lord.
Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God.